All right, uh, let's go ahead and make a start. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Megan Tinsley, lecturer in sociology at Manchester, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here. This evening's public lecture is sponsored by the Center on the Dynamics of Ethnicity, or CODE, the UK's leading center of research into racial, ethnic, and religious inequalities. CODE is based at the University of Manchester and draws get together an interdisciplinary range of experts from universities across England and Scotland. Our research encompasses five themes, mapping inequality, economic inequalities, education, culture, politics, and activism, health, mental health, and aging. To that end, we've undertaken projects ranging from a large-scale national survey of racial and ethnic inequalities during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, to an ethnography of contested statues of colonizers and slaveholders. CODE works closely with partner organizations in the voluntary and community sectors, local and national government, and the education sector to share our research with a wide range of audiences. The event is also hosted by the British Sociological Association's Postcolonial and Decolonial Transformation Study Group. Now in its fourth year, the study group takes as its premise that the contemporary world is shaped by historical yet ongoing processes of colonialism, enslavement, and imperialism and their legacy. Yet mainstream sociology fails to engage with these processes as constitutive of the making of the modern world. The study group aims to better understand these historical processes as a central aspect of the sociological project. It further seeks to examine their political, economic, social, and epistemological consequences in the present. It's exactly in the spirit of, teach, of tracing the imperial origins of the social world that distinguishes the work of this evening's speaker, Professor Julian Goh. Julian Goh is professor of sociology at the University of Chicago, where he's also a senior fellow of the Society of Fellows and faculty affiliate of the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture and the Com Committee on International Relations. His work has had a profound impact on my own thinking, particularly his framing of postcolonial sociology and his commitment to globalizing and historicizing social thought. Uh, much of Julian's work has focused on the US empire, resulting in articles and books such as The American Colonial State in the Philippines, Colonial Perspectives, uh, that was in 2003, co-edited with Ann Foster, American Empire and the Politics of Meaning in 2008, and Patterns of Empire, The British and American Empires, 1688 to Present, uh, published in 2011. His other work is on post-colonial thought and social theory, culminating in a 2016 book of the same name, and Global Historical Sociology and Transnational Field Theory, which culminated in the co-edited volumes uh, Fielding Transnationalism uh, with Monica Krause and Global Historical Sociology with George Lawson. He's also working on a project that recovers anti-colonial thought as a critical form of social theory. And last year, he delivered the annual lecture of the British Journal of Sociology on that topic. Uh, that lecture has recently been published alongside numerous critiques uh, in a special issue of the BJS. His scholarship has won prizes from the American Sociological Association, the Eastern Sociological Society, the American Political Science Association, and the International Studies Association, among other organizations. He's the winner of the Louis A. Coser Award for Theoretical Agenda Setting in Sociology, uh, given by the American Sociological Association. In 2021 and 2022, Julian served as president of the Social Science History Association. This evening, Julian's lecture will draw from his forthcoming book, Policing Empires, Mo uh, Militarization and Race in Britain and America, 1829 to Present. The book delves into the colonial origins of modern civil policing and frames the militarization of the police as a colonial boomerang, an effect of imperial feedback. It's particularly urgent to name and understand how imperialism shapes the present at this political moment when imperial amnesia has made it possible to imagine Britain as an island nation that denies the imperial origin of a period of crises, from the dehumanization of asylum seekers to the global climate crisis. As Derek Walcott writes in Ruins of a Great House, the rot remains with us, the men are gone. Only by tracing the historical origins of contemporary crises can we hope to overcome them. And so with this, this is, with this goal in mind, uh, I'm looking forward to this evening's lecture. Uh, everyone, please join me in welcoming Professor Julian Go. Great, so I just, I'll do this. Yeah. Yeah. Great, thank you so much for that introduction. Thanks to all of you for um, coming, coming here. It's my first time in Manchester, and it's a great pleasure to uh, Get to, get to know um, the university. 
Um, I'm going to start with um, some images of the London Metropolitan Police that you can easily find online. I think one of these just comes from the, the London Met's um, website. Um, and what we see here, of course, is the classic image of the, uh, the peaceful British Bobby, right? The um, supposedly unarmed, friendly neighborhood cop who uh, is there to serve and protect and who represents the people. Um, this, of course, is the image that was birthed when Sir Robert Peel created the London Metropolitan Police in 1829. Um, and for those of you who may or may not already know, the London Police in 1829 was meant to be a, a kind of new idea of policing. It was meant to fight crime and disorder at once, and it was meant to do so without the coercive tools of the military. Um, Peel, in fact, meant for the London Met to be a civilian alternative <coughs> to the army, the alternative to, to calling in the army um, in, in, in issue, during issues of public um, disorder. Um, and he also meant it as an alternative to the military, heavily militarized police forces that you'd find on the continent, the, the French gendarmerie, for example. Um, and so Peel came up with this idea of a new organization, a new state organization, um, that we now know of as the police. Um, it's now become the, the, the civil police model. This is meant to be a force um, that is uh, of, by, and for the people, a civilian rather than a military force, a power meant to be representative of and hence um, friendly to the populace. Um, this is, in fact, the policing model that we live with in the United States as well. Uh, because when modern policing was born in the United States, uh, Police departments in the 19th century, when they first emerged, they modeled themselves after the London Metropolitan Police. And to this day, American police officers can recite to you Peel's principles, a, a series of principles that Peel laid out for the London Metropolitan Police. Um, so the civil police model is a dominant one. It's a sort of transatlantic Anglo-American form. Um, it's, it's also a model that has insinuated uh, a bifurcation between the uh, policing and the army that we take for granted today. That is, you know, the army is seen as the organization responsible for dealing with violent coercion against enemies overseas and the police is for citizens at home. This is a bifurcation that in fact the United States um, military holds dear. Um, historically, says the U.S. Army Field Manual, right, the U.S. has attempted to separate the functions of domestic law enforcement and the military based on the different missions of the two groups and the populations they are intended to encounter. Um, they're pr to protect and serve, respect the rights of offenders and victims, and resort to violence in desperate situations. Military forces, in contrast, are meant to uh, deal with external threats, often within hostile environments. So the, the term civil police is, is, is meant to be precise here, right? The word civil, of course, invokes the word citizen, um, as in a police force of, by, and for citizens, rather than for enemies and foreigners, and it likewise summons the idea of civility, right? So as peace rather than um, brute force. But of course, we all know by now, we should all know by now, that this civil police ideal is just that. It's an ideal. It's, uh, it's an ideal that's not yet realized. It's, it's an ideal that one could argue is merely propaganda for perpetuating this idea of, of the police. And, and it's really not a description of a reality so much as it is a, a, a way of, of masking uh, deeper coercion and brutality. Um, it is, of course, by now well known, uh, hopefully by all of you, that um, in the United States, policing is far from the civil police model. It's racist, violent, and militaristic. We've, we, of course, have seen this in the United States um, ever since the uh, Ferguson protests in 2014, the Standing Rock, right? All, all throughout uh, the past decade, we've seen this and, and, and earlier, right? The, the so-called civil police here are, are doing what? They're wielding milita military-grade weaponry. They're using tear gas canisters. Um, they're... they're, they're uh, riding in a mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicles um, and wearing military uniforms and gear. Um, and in fact, this militarization of policing, as it's sometimes called, um, actually is, it, it involves much more than just military uniforms and gear. Um, 
the sociologist Peter Kraska has a very helpful defini definition for helping us think about the, the, the depth of militarization, right? He says that it's, it's the process whereby civilian police increasingly draw from and pattern themselves around the tenets of militarism and the military model, and it involves the adoption not just of right, military materials, military equipment, but also cultural, organizational, and operational aspects of the military. So modes of organization, military mentalities, training, um, you know, the, the police have adopted these things too. Um, you see this all over the American police, SWAT units, of course, being um, a, a prime example, right? The police here, it's not just about having um, military weapons, it's about adopting military cultures and operations and, and tactics. Um, this militarization, of course, also marks the British police. It's clear that the British police are not as armed um, as the American police, but we know that this doesn't mean that the British police aren't armed. Um, this is something Stuart Hall noted long ago, right? Um, the Briti in his Comte lectures in 1779, where he pointed out that essentially by that time and through the present, the police, uh, even in Britain, have in, in a sense become an armed and fully equipped technical force, not that different from um, the United States uh, model of policing. Um, and of course, um, the police have armed units, undergo military grade training here. Um, they use military surveillance technology like drones and often share the mentality and mindset of military forces. Um, recent reports by groups uh, like the Network for Police Monitoring here in the UK have noted this trend of militarization, have um, noted that it's deeply troubling. And of course, along with this has come all kinds of racially disproportionate policing. Um, police, uh, deaths by police here are not as um, prevalent as in the United States, but there are some. Um, and the likelihood, the odds, uh, even of small numbers uh, of, of police killings here, the odds of, of being non-white and being killed by police are higher here in England than they are. Um, the, there are um, uh, disproportionate uses of force by the British police. Right, so there's racial disparities as well uh, between the British, uh, I mean, in the, in the British police um, that's not fundamentally, I would argue, different from the American police. So uh, for me, as a, as a sociologist and as a historical sociologist, um, when I'm confronted with these facts, um, I find myself asking, why? Right? How and why have we come to this point where the civil police, the so-called civil police, are militarized? Um, this is a historical question. right? It's, it's about what has happened. Um, in the past, but it's, it's a question that um, is animated by the conviction that what we need desperately is an understanding of the present through a critical understanding of the past. Right? So I, I, you know, I'm, I'm yearning for a, a kind of critical genealogy of militarized policing, um, a history of the present, or more precisely, um, as hopefully we'll see by the end of my talk, what I'm seeking is a historical sociology of our seemingly post-colonial present of militarized policing. So ultimately, what I want to tell in trying to address this question, um, what I want to tell is a story tonight about policing um, that differs somewhat, not only from the standard narratives of the, you know, the, the civil police, but also um, from dominant existing accounts. Um, and, and my story differs uh, in several respects from dominant existing accounts. One has to do with historicization. Now, when you read the literature on um, British policing, um, most accounts suggest that uh, the British police became more militaristic in recent years. Um, some point to the early 1980s or maybe even the 1970s, when, according to some accounts, British policing took a paramilitary turn. So those of you familiar with this literature will know the debates about the paramilitary turn. Um, uh, and a, a similar story is told about police militarization in the United States, right? Admitting that the United States police have always been armed for a long time, there's stories about how police militarization really is something relatively new that goes back to the 1990s or really took form uh, in the 1970s. Um, what I want to show tonight is um, that when you, when you take history seriously, you'll see that in fact the police in both Britain and the United States have been militarized from the very beginning of modern policing, right? Um, and again, militarized in this broader sense of adopting mindsets and tactics and forms. Um, and more precisely, since the very beginning of the modern police, what we've seen um, historically is, is, is multiple moments in which the police 
turn to the military and become militarized, or, or I, I think of these as waves of militarization, particular periods since the 19th century where you have an intensified militarized turn. And these, these turns that we've seen more recently and that most scholars talk about, 70s and 80s, are just one wave, one moment uh, in a longer history of, of these waves of militarization. Um, the second claim is that these uh, waves of militarization manifest deeper logics. So I'm, I'm very historically minded, I'm a historical sociologist, but I'm also a historical sociologist. So I see patterns to history, right? And, and, and there are logics at work here that I want to uh, show you, um, that I want to make transparent. Um, and these are logics that have to do with things, I think, uh, that aren't taken seriously enough in, in most scholarship on policing, and that is um, empire and the global color line. Um, I want to show ultimately that really to understand police militarization, and I'd argue the very essence and character of policing today, we need to understand policing's deep racialized imperiality, or more precisely, um, the coloniality of policing. That's how I think about it. So what I want to do in the, in the rest of my time is um, try to elaborate some of these points. This is coming from my book, and I just want to um, discuss a variety of some of these moments of militarization um, that involve a lot of different sites from London and Manchester all the way to Berkeley, California. Um, the story will also bring in colonial zones from, from the Philippines, for example, and Ireland, among other places. Um, so I, I'm, let me start by... Um, Turning back to the London Metropolitan Police, which was created um, in 1829, as I'm guessing most of you know. To really understand this event, um, you do have to contextualize the London Metropolitan Police um, and realize that um, policing as we know it didn't really exist before 1829. Um, the word police, in fact, had not referred to an institutional organization so much as an act or function of government. And it often referred to uh, the regulation of the economy. So if you go back and read Adam Smith, for example, he'll use the word police, but he's really thinking about policing as an act uh, by the government of, of regulating the economy. Uh, and to deal with crime, um, London and all of England really only had a motley array of watchmen, often volunteer, and local parish constables many of whom were part-time um, or paid by fees to deal with disorder or outbreaks of, um, of violence or of mass disorder, um, authorities had to call in the army. So the new police of London changed all of that, right? It brought a centralized, full-time, professionalized, uniform police that was tasked with tackling crime and regulating public order at once. Um, and again, this is why it's, it's not entirely wrong to, to refer to the London uh, model as a, a civil police, because again, it was meant to replace the army and be a force of civilians. And so this was the police force, as I mentioned, that other cities emulated um, after 1829, Liverpool, Bristol, Birmingham, these are just some of the first ones, Manchester, 1839, uh, New York City, Boston, Savannah, Charleston, these are some of the earliest ones in the United States, and you know, they all when they constructed their police and replaced the constable and watch system, they all looked to London as the model and expressly said, we want a London-style police. So, um, what does militarization have to do with this? Well, on the one hand, you know, as I, as I stressed, the London police and the US police after that was meant to be an alternative to the army, right? Calling in the army to deal with um, strikes and protests and mass disorder had become far too onerous, far too problematic. Um, and, and so officials at the time began contemplating an alternative. Um, of course, Sir Robert Peel, who I've already mentioned, was one of those um, founders, and, and he had initially to deal with this problem, the problem of having to call in the army, he initially thought of creating a kind of police much like they had in France and Europe, which is, was this French militaristic um, gendarmerie for England. Um, and he contemplated this. He knew that it wouldn't work, right? Um, his upper class friends, uh, the rising middle classes and the public more generally were jealous of their liberties and if there's anything they, they hated more, uh, it, it was French style militarism, right? And as well as the use of the army on sacred home ground. So Peel was forced to create something new, right? To come up with some kind of new model to deal with crime and rising disorder, but to, to, to not um, rely on the military on the one hand or the a type of gendarmerie, um, or, or no coercive force at all. Um, so this is where he comes up with the idea of the civil police. 
But the tension lies here because um, while the new police was indeed crafted as an alternative to the army, it was nonetheless militarized from the outset. The new police, in fact, borrowed not so much from the military per se, but more precisely from colonial forms of control. Now, it's commonly noted in, in the literature that Peel, who founded the new police in England, had had colonial experience. What he did, he had previously served as chief secretary of Ireland, essentially its sort of colonial governor. Um, but what I want to highlight is not only that Peel had served in Ireland, but also that forms of colonial coercion that he had helped devise there in Ireland for the purposes of colonial rule, um, that these actually served as his inspiration for creating the London Metropolitan Police. Um, and, and we know from, from some scholarship uh, already that, that Pew had in mind the, um, some, some of these colonial forms, but I really want to um, sort of dig into it and, and get into some of these details because I think it's, it's much deeper than even most scholarship acknowledges. Um, for instance, in Ireland, right, the, uh, colonial governors and uh, all colonial states had to construct various forms of um, colonial coercion. And there had been the Dublin Metropolitan Police before um, 1829, which is essentially an armed urban colonial counterinsurgency force um, whose duties were exactly to control crime and um, deal with uh, public disorder and uprisings. And of course, in the colonial site, the line between crime and uprisings was never clear. They're, you know, it's always, um, they're always bleeding together. Um, so there had been the Dublin Metropolitan Police already that Peel was familiar with. In 1814, a decade before he created the London Police, Peel created the Peace Preservation Force, as it was called, to cover, essentially, to police the rural districts. Um, his Peace Preservation Force eventually merged with the 1822 Irish Constabulary, later renamed, of course, the Royal Irish Constabulary. Um, many of the Irish um, Constabulary's officers were veterans of the army. The structure of the force followed the army's hierarchy. Um, the Constabulary were regularly drilled and trained in military methods. They were heavily armed, bearing pistols and bayoneted carbines or light rifles. They were housed in barracks to be called out as needed and distributed across the Irish counties, which were divided up into policing districts. So these were all colonial counterinsurgency forces, tools of the colonial state, meant to maintain English rule, to suppress anti-colonial unrest and insurgencies, um, while also attending to criminality. And so these colonial forces, in fact, were the inspiration for Peel and, and the London Metropolitan Police. Peel simply transferred them to London soil with some slight modifications to make them palatable for the English public. Um, so, for instance, the very structure of the London Police was modeled after the colonial forces in Ireland, right? So just as the Irish Constabulary uh, had been centralized in the hands of civilian officials, um, and in fact in Peel himself, who was serving in, in Dublin Castle. So too was command and control of the London Metropolitan Police centralized in the Home Office to be directed by Peel too, because at that time he was Home Secretary. Um, and just as Peel's constabulary in Ireland had been organized along military lines with officers, non-commissioned officers and men, so did Peel structure the London Police in exactly the same way. And in fact, Peel insisted that the new London Police be commanded by commissioners not just with military experience, but more precisely with experience in Ireland. Um, one of those men um, was this guy, Charles Rowan. Has anybody heard of Charles Rowan? So he um, was, uh, had been in the military, but he also served in Ireland. And in turn, Rowan, um, appointed by Peel to be co-commissioner, he began structuring the London police um, based upon his own colonial experience and his knowledge of colonial regimes. Rowan and Peel, for example, um, structured the force into a military hierarchy. Beneath Rowan um, were a series of other officers, including 16 sergeants, a title taken directly from the army and simply in use for the police. The new force was also uniformed, just as the army was. Um, Again, this was a new thing. The constables and watches had not been uniformed. To have a uniform police was a brand new thing. Um, and so um, Rowan followed this model. Um, the color of the uniform was blue rather than the army's red. But notably, the Dublin Metropolitan Police had also worn blue uniforms. And many of the senior officers of the London Met were taken directly from the military. And on top of this, the entire system of surveillance and patrol 
that Roman created for the London police um, had colonial inspiration. What Rowan did was create new police divisions to be patrolled by constables operating according to the beat system, right? So um, this is, does anybody know the beat system? It's, it's a system where policemen of each section were assigned to a specific territory or a beat that they were supposed to walk around and cover. Um, now, it's so common in the United States to think of the term police beat that we, we completely forget for example, the origins. Um, the origins are the London Metropolitan Police, but the London Metropolitan Police, through Rowan, had actually gotten it from colonial experiences. And it was essentially a mingling of two models of colonial coercion. First, it took from slave patrols that the British had invented in British, the British Caribbean and the Carolinas. These had been created for inspecting slave dwellings for arms or illicit goods, disrupting any large gatherings of slaves, hunting fugitives, and generally keeping slaves in line. They had been organized into territorial districts or beats, which each patrol was to cover, and they were called beats. Um, now, the Met's new beat system combined this system with the British Army's new light infantry units. These were highly mobile counterinsurgency units that Charles Rowan's commander in the army, Sir John Moore, had developed and used against slave rebels in St. Lucia in the 1790s, and then in 1798 to rout the Irish insurgents during the 1798 rebellion. Light infantry were also essentially what Peel's Peace Preservation Force and the Irish Constabulary were also, right? highly mobile, um, small units utilizing open order formations rather than closed order formations. And these colonial operations were what informed Rowan's beat system. Assigned distinct territories that they were to cover the new police patrols, survey populations as slave militia patrols surveyed slave populations in their territories, but as the patrols were also meant to be flexible so that they could move across and through swaths of territory swiftly as the situation demanded, and as they're meant to be mutually supporting, coming to the aid of other patrols when necessary, the beat patrols mimicked Moore's light infantry and with them Peel's Peace Preservation Force and the Irish Constabulary. So this is what I mean when, when I say that the London Metropolitan Police was militarized from the get-go, right? It was drawing from military forms, operations, and tactics, but more precisely, it wasn't just military, this is colonial military or colonial regimes of coercion that they're drawing from, right? Um, and in this sense, I'd actually, the term militarization is somewhat imprecise here, right? Um, yes, the London Metropolitan Police borrowed military operations and forms, and in this sense, we could talk about it as militarization, but it also more precisely borrowed from colonial modalities of coercion. So rather than just militarization, what we have uh, is the coloniality of policing. Right? While police militarization is just about appropriating military tools and practices generally, the coloniality of policing highlights the appropriation of the tools, technologies, tactics, and mindsets developed and deployed at the frontiers of empire to violently repress deviance and disorder from racialized peoples deemed other and inferior. Now, work by Georgina Sinclair and other historians have pointed to this in regards to a sort of blurred lines between colonial policing um, and British policing. But to make better sense of this, um, I turn to anti-colonial thinkers. For what the coloniality of policing alerts us to is that militarization is essentially a product of military, uh, of, of imperial feedback, or what we might think of as the boomerang effect. This is the process whereby the tools of empire overseas are brought back home for domestic use. Now, just something about this concept. Um, in the 1970s, uh, Michel Foucault, in his lectures at the Collège de France, uh, titled Society Must Be Defended, um, Foucault also alludes to this boomerang effect in one of, the, one of the only moments, or one of the rare moments where Foucault actually talks about colonialism. Um, he acknowledges that right, it should never be forgotten that while colonization with its techniques and its political and juridical weapons obviously transported European models to other continents, it's also had a considerable boomerang effect on the mechanisms of power in the West and on the apparatuses, institutions, and techniques of power. A whole series of colonial models was brought back to the West. So Foucault's talking about it here. But in fact, long before Foucault, it was the Martinican anti-colonial thinker M.A. Césaire who originally coined the term. And Cesar used the term uh, 
to characterize Hitler's violent in invasion and rule of neighboring European countries, claiming that what Hitler was doing in Europe reflected the importation of the processes and practices of European colonialism abroad. And so it was this process, the return of the boomerang, um, that, uh, that Césaire was, uh, was, was thinking about when he was thinking about um, Hitler's colonization of Europe. Um, but it's also, I think, a, a way to think about how colonialism shaped modern policing in Britain from its very birth, right? Um, so this is what I mean, I'm getting at coloniality. Right? The London Metropolitan Police has a kind of colonial unconscious. It was modeled upon and borrowed tactics and forms from, 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 the, um, from the colonial site. Now, there's one other aspect to this boomerang effect and the coloniality of policing that I want to stress, and it's something that even Cesar doesn't really point to. Um, and it has to do with the historical conditions or causes of the, the boomerang effect, right? So what are the historical conditions under which the tools, tactics, um, and techniques of empire are, in fact, imported for domestic use? And, and, and I want to argue that there are, in fact, social logics behind this importation. And particularly, the, these are racialized logics. And by understanding this, we can finally unlock this puzzle to this, the, the civil police. Um, what do I mean by this? Well, you know, if you, if you read the standard historiography on why Peel and, um, uh, Peel and other cities adopted this civil police model, what they'll say is that um, what Peel and other authorities were, were responding to were perceived rises in threats to law and order, so perceived increases in crime, uh, more and more strikes, more and more public disorder that sort of compelled Peel and other authorities to come up with some new policing form. Um, but in fact, what these historiographies miss is that these threats that were perceived by Peel and others were in fact racialized at the time. What Peel and other officials were responding to when they created the police was not so much crime and disorder in general, but rather the specific perceived threats posed by colonial peoples who had been migrating to urban metropolitan centers. And in this wave of militarization in England at the time, this meant the Irish. Of course, the Irish had been coming to England for as long as English rule began, but the early 1800s, just before the birth of the new police, saw heightened migration to England, um, even before the so-called famine of the, the 40s and 50s. Um, the Union, as never before, facilitated England's colonization of Irish agriculture, a process which in turn had ejected thousands of dispossessed, displaced, and destitute Irish subjects, a veritable colonial reserve army of the unemployed. At the same time, the rising cotton manufacturing and shipping industries, and this is where it's tied to slavery, um, required more cheap labor, and the Irish eventually filled the gap. In England, the numbers of Irish rose from 40,000 in the 1780s to 590,000 by 1831. And of course, the influx of Irish, as is usually the case with the influx of any migrant group, fueled all kinds of anxieties among the English, who began complaining about the influx of the so-called Irish hordes. The migration further fueled long-standing processes of racialization. The Irish were seen as fundamentally foreign, unalterably alien, and incorrigibly inferior. Scientific racism had yet to take full hold, but references to Irish biology, blood, and stock increased in this period, mingling with cultural explanations of Irish inferiority. Stark differentiation between Irish workers and English workers followed as countless so-called experts and officials and employers claimed that the Irish were physically predisposed to certain types of labor, were less civilized, more disorderly and violent than English workers, and this, of course, justified their low pay and their low position in the occupational hierarchy. The Irish were, in short, the racialized subproletariat of transatlantic cotton colonialism. And what all of this meant at the time was that when Peel and other police reformers beginning in the 1820s and through the 1830s spoke about needing a new police to deal with rising crime and disorder, the Irish were, in fact, their implicit and often explicit reference point. 
They classified the Irish as inherently lawless and criminal, and most officials blamed the Irish for the seeming increase in crime. They also connected Irish migrants to the increased potential for uprisings in London and around the manufacturing districts of the country. Um, in the English mind, the Irish were inherently disorderly and violent, and this perceived racial threat was what had compelled the creation of the Irish constabulary over in Ireland after all. And now, in the 1820s, to the English mind, the barbarians were at the gates. And indeed, as many um, migrant Irish had joined the growing worker rebellions across the, country, across the country, they were seen as not only at the gates, but as flooding through them. In 1828, a quarterly review article blamed crime on the Irish, while also predicting outright rebellion. The Irish conspirators of 1798, this um, author said, were sending the men to England to incite English workers and were acting as the Guy Foxites of Ireland, plotting to, quote, make a glorious bonfire of London. Even black radicals were added to the threat as the press seized upon the fact that William Cuffey, an English worker of African origin, had become a leading figure in the Chartist movement. And the London press complained that the London Chartists were not, in fact, an English movement but essentially an Irish movement led by an African. So the formation of the London police in 1829 was not so much a response to crime and disorder in general, not in response to workers in general, but in particular a response to the so-called Irish problem. And so it was fitting that to deal with the Irish problem in London, you use the same methods you had used in colonial Ireland. And this, I argue, is why Peel and Rowan and other police reformers created the new police and why they modeled it upon Ireland's colonial forces. While they certainly hoped to manage crime and disorder, also on their mind was the need to manage the fact of thousands of colonized peoples, the Irish, invading their putatively sacred metropolitan spaces. Um, I did some research into um, the arrests made by the London Met in the 1830s and tons of records, but um, when you take a sample of them, what you find is that the Irish were disproportionately arrested. While the Irish-born and children of Irish-born immigrants made up about 5% right, uh, of, of, of London's population um, in this period, um, so that's this dotted line, the, uh, um, the uh, Irish often made up over 10% of all arrests on average, and at times constituted up to even more than that. Uh, mostly for petty crimes like theft and, and other um, petty crimes. Um, it was kind of an early form of broken windows policing, I'd argue. But in, in any case, what you see is that the Irish were disproportionately arrested, almost in some cases twice as much um, relative to their actual uh, percentage of populations. They were arrested at double the rate they should have been, in other words, if they were not over-policed. So this, I'm arguing, is the racialized logic of the boomerang and also the logic behind the birth of the civil police in London. It's also the logic that underlay the creation of the Manchester Police, which was founded in 1839 um, upon uh, Manchester's creation as a borough by an act of parliament. Um, and in fact, Peel had been one of the architects of this um, of this force because it was, it was created by an act of parliament. Um, and Peel had in fact hoped not only to handle the Irish problem in London, but initially to create a sort of London metropolitan police all across the country to deal with everywhere where the Irish were going. Um, and so his role in the creation of the police here in Manchester was an expression of this larger plan. Um, but the, the creation of the Manchester police was, was not only by Peel, local authorities, observers, officials, and the local watch forces had in fact also wanted a London style police based upon the repeated uh, claims that Manchester needed a new force to deal with a rising crime and disorder from who? From the uh, importation of Irish labor, right? So I, the Irish were coming into Manchester, particularly to work in the rising cotton industry. Um, by 1851, the percentage of Manchester's population that was born in Ireland was about 13.13% or a little more, and the only other city in England that had a larger per capita Irish population was Liverpool, which also was among the first to create a, a new police after London. Um, and again, the reaction here to the importation of this Irish uh, population um, was, was not a happy one, right? They needed Irish labor, um, as is so often the case with migrants, um, but they did not countenance what they perceived to be Irish barbarism, Irish crime, Irish disorder, and they classified the Irish immigrants as, again, an inferior race. Um, Dr. James Kay um, 
who was a, did research here in Irish in Manchester, um, his ideas exemplified this way of thinking. You know, he talked about how the, the existing constable and watch system um, was fine for the English, but when you have the Irish coming in, right, this inferior population in his eyes, you needed something else, right? Um, so the defective state of police in large provincial towns of England had not been formed to produce any serious inconvenience on account of the habits of obedience to law, which the English people had formed, he claimed. Um, but when large bodies of Irish of less orderly habits and far more prone to use violence and fits of intoxication settled permanently in these towns, the existing police force, which sufficient to repress crime and disorders among a purely English population, has been found under these altered circumstances inadequate to the regular enforcement of the law. So again, this, this sense of pending rising in crime and disorder from this racialized group is what compelled the formation of, of, of the new police, even here in Manchester. Um, and fittingly, the, the Manchester police duplicated the colonial form of the London Metropolitan Police. Um, Sir Charles Shaw, a former military officer, was made the first chief commissioner here. Um, Shaw's junior officers included a man named Colonel Gilbert Hogg, who had served in Ireland. Um, and together, Shaw and Hogg did what their predecessors in London were doing. They instituted military-style policies and programs, putting them in uniforms resembling a, resembling a paramilitary organization and drilling them like a military force. Um, Shaw's successor, Captain Edward Willis, continued the trend. Willis had served with the British Army in Ireland. He had also served with the British Army in Bermuda and Jamaica. Um, and once take, taking his post, he increased the ranks uh, of the force uh, by 70 for a total of 390 men, making Manchester the second largest police force outside London in terms of ratio of police to population. And needless to say, the over-policing of the Irish in Manchester proceeded with haste. Let me now turn to the United States, <coughs> where modern police departments emulating the London model had all emerged beginning in the mid-1800s. Um, in my book, I talk about, for example, the, the formation of the police in New York City in 1844 um, and the birth of the police in Savannah, Georgia, which was the first city in the South, the American South, to have a civil police modeled after London. Um, in both of these cases, it's the same story. Um, there was a perceived... Uh, rise in crime and disorder located um, as coming from racialized others. There was some slight variation depending upon the populations and also slight variations in the type of forms that the police adopted, largely due to the influence of settler colonialism and the United States. Um, but it's very much a similar story and in fact the formation of the police in major American cities also involved the Irish. Right? Because the Irish had been coming to New York, of course, and they had been uh, coming to Savannah in, in large numbers in this period. Um, they were brought in to deal with uh, the new amounts of cotton that were being picked by slaves, and Savannah was a major port. Right? So uh, cotton from the U.S. south from, the, from slaves would be stored in Savannah and then shipped to Liverpool, um, where they would be unloaded in Liverpool by Irish workers, and then brought to Manchester where they were spun into cotton by Irish workers. Um, and in Savannah, the Irish were crucial for being uh, working in the warehouses and working at the ports. Um, and so in both Savannah and New York, there was this rise in Irish populations. In Savannah, it was particularly troublesome to the officials because the Irish were living with freed slaves, the freed slave population, and with slave populations that had been hired out in the cities. Um, and so this whole process prompted these racialized fears that led to the creation of the new police. And it's not surprising that in both New York and in Savannah, the new police were created um, under the administration of a political party known as the Know Nothing Party. This was a famous anti-immigrant political party. Um, I can discuss those cases uh, further in the Q&A, but um, for lack of time, let me jump ahead. I want to give an example of at least one later wave of militarization, because again, the larger story is that you have militarization from the beginning due to the boomerang effect, but then you have these other moments. So let me briefly talk about this other moment in the US. This is a formative period in, in the early 20th century in the United States. And this would be my last major example. Um, so one of the things, again, you have to understand is that this period in the United States was um, a crucial period for uh, policing. It's of, often called the modernization or reform era of policing. Um, prior to this period, you did have these 
London model type of police departments, as I just mentioned. Um, but around the turn of the century, uh, the police were modernized. Essentially, all these new innovations were created, um, new developments. Police departments were increasingly professionalized. They were rationalized. They expanded their capabilities. For example, um, it used to be that uh, prior to this period, the police um, were moving around just by foot in their respective beats. But uh, what came with this period were um, the creation of mobile squads to extend their reach. For instance, you know, whereas most patrolmen in the 19th century covered their own small part of the city using uh, on foot, um, police departments began adding mounted patrols using horses and then bicycles and then later, of course, cars. This is the mounted police unit in Philadelphia. Um, police also adopted fingerprinting techniques. They um, created new professional training programs and schools, and this was uh, criminology emerged in the United States from these new training programs and, and this sort of modernization process. Um, and so you have in this period this fundamental transformation in policing where it became more powerful um, and involved new surveillance techniques and all these innovations. Um, and this was actually a kind of militarization and more precisely a boomerang effect. One of the leaders of this whole movement across the United States in, in modernization is this guy, August Vollmer. Um, now, if you ask any policeman, the next time you go to the United States, ask a policeman if they know August Vollmer, he will say yes, or she will say yes, because August Vollmer is taught as one of the founders of the sort of all of these innovations in policing in the United States. Um, and I think a lot of what he did is actually inspired developments in, in, in the London Metropolitan Police too. Um, but in any case, he was a, an important figure. He, he actually got a start as chief of police in Berkeley, California in 1905. And then he um, then served later as a chief of police in Los Angeles. And throughout, he really developed all of these innovations that um, the era became known for. He was the one who came up with mounting patrolmen. He set up the first police training schools and professionalization schools. He used um, new systems of records and surveillance and criminal identification. Um, you know, that's why uh, Vollmer is often referred to in the United States as the father of modern policing. <coughs> Now, when I read about Vollmer, I, was, I wondered, why is it that he was so innovative? Right? What made, I mean, he was just chief of police in Berkeley. Berkeley is a tiny college town, right? It's hardly something that would, you know, foment these innovations. Um, and one of the interesting things I learned was that Vollmer, uh, as you can see here, almost see here, right? This is a police uniform, but he had a military background. Um, in fact, before becoming police chief, he had been part of America's colonial empire, having served in America's largest colony at the time, the Philippines. Um, for those of you who don't know, the U.S. had defeated the Spanish during the Spanish-American War in 1898 and took the Philippines as its largest colony. Uh, Filipinos resisted, leading to the Philippine-American War, which lasted from 1899 to 1902. And Vollmer had been involved in all of this. He had been in the U.S. Army in 1898, fought the Spanish, and then remained in the Philippines as part of the American occupying force. And he joined the Americans' new counterinsurgency efforts against the Filipino rebels. And he had been handpicked to join a new elite counterinsurgency unit um, charged with penetrating the interior to conquer and capture rebel leaders. This was America's first overseas, major overseas war in Asia. It prefigured a lot of what would happen in Vietnam. And so this was a very formative period for American intervention as well and for American military. Um, so after all of this, Vollmer returned to Berkeley and became chief of police in 1905. And he brought with him some of these new colonial counterinsurgency techniques that were being developed at the time by the U.S. military in the Philippines. Um, his idea of mounting police forces, for instance, came partly from the American Army's new counterinsurgency efforts in the Philippine archipelago, these new elite um, horse units. Um, he also borrowed intelligence methods from the U.S. Army's counterinsurgency efforts for gathering data and intelligence on Filipino insurgents. He also invented pin mapping based upon the colonial counterinsurgency efforts. And in fact, Vollmer is known as the originator of pin mapping. Um, pin mapping is this technique at the time which, where police would uh, have a map in the city and they'd put pins in, in wherever crimes had occurred. This would allow um, them to deploy their forces 
um, to those areas with a lot of um, perceived crime. Um, this is from Vollmer's own papers. He did this with crime and also crim criminal residence, so where criminals lived, he map out where they lived. Um, but he would do the same thing with crime, and so he would be able to deploy his mounted forces to the areas where um, there was most crime to occur. Now, this, of course, um, if, if, if contemporary police officers today saw this, they would say, oh, yeah, okay, this is um, the origins of predictive policing yeah. or hotspot policing, which is, you know, touted with the whole story behind that we can talk about. But um, with computerization, it was a, seen as a whole new thing. But it's essentially the same thing. It's, it's hotspot policing, like this is Philadelphia, um, where they use computers to do the same thing, to highlight um, where the crimes occurred and to deploy forces accordingly. Of course, it ends up being a cover for racist policing. These are neighborhoods where, of course, crimes supposedly have occurred, but we all know that crimes are perceived to occur only in certain neighborhoods and racialized neighborhoods. It's based on historic discrimination in data collection, all kinds of historic racist biases, which then make it perceive objectively that these are where the criminals are. And so that's where the police have go and over patrol, over police. That's why you have all these problems um, that we see. Um, and so this goes back to Vollmer. But Romer himself developed this technique from his experience in the Philippine-American War. The U.S. Army had, in fact, innovated pin mapping techniques specifically to track the movements of Filipino insurgents, locate their camps in the vast terrain of central Luzon, and embark upon their search and destroy missions, right? The, the Americans had no idea what this country was, the Philippines, so they really had to rely upon maps from the Spanish and to you know, uh, create this, these new uh, mapping techniques. And this is exactly what Balmer brought back to American policing. He called it um, the art of making war on the map. Um, he later explained to his LA force right, that he, ever since the Spanish American War days, leading into his Philippine experience, he studied a military tactics. We're conducting a war. A war against the enemies of society. We must not forget that. Again, this is early 20th century. This is when, if you look historically, this is when the term war against crime first emerges in the early 20th century. That's, it's not like a 70s thing. This emerges earlier, I, I would argue, as a result of America's uh, colonial conquests overseas. Now, other police forces brought back more than pin mapping or mounted police units. For example, in the 1910s and 1920s, some police across the country were soon discovered to be using a mode of torture to extract confessions from largely African-American suspects. Um, one of those modes of torture was called the water cure. Um, this was an early variant of waterboarding, where police extract confessions from suspects by holding them down and pouring water down their throats. But this, too, was an effect of empire. It had been the chosen mode of torture by the U.S. Army in the Philippines during the Philippine-American War. It was also reportedly being used by U.S. forces in the 1910s during America's occupation of Haiti. So methods of torture that colonial um, counterinsurgency forces were using were also brought back to um, the United States. In the early 70s, we see the same thing in Chicago with Vietnam War veterans bringing back torture. There's uh, controversial cases there. But again, this goes back to a long-standing practice of the boomerang effect right, coming back. Um, and again, what's behind this whole process of this boomerang effect of bringing back these colonial techniques was racialized. Uh, racialized processes. You know, it's no accident that this whole reform movement and this modernization and the adoption of, of these techniques, first inspired by Vollmer and spread all around U.S. police departments in the early 20th century, it's no accident that, that happened in the early 20th century because this was in the wake of another wave of uh, migration. Um, this was a period when not only were new European immigrants coming in, um, but um, there was also the beginnings of African-American migration from the South to the North. In the South itself, more and more African-Americans were moving from the countryside to the cities. Um, in the West, the United States had had Asian Exclusion Acts, but that had slowed the influx of Chinese or Japanese, but illegal immigration still continued, and many Asians migrated internally, moving across the region, and particularly to urban centers. And of course, to white officials, these new immigrants and migrants were not the most welcoming sight. They claimed that it brought new rises in crime and a decay in public morality, new lawlessness and disorder, such as this image with the Chinese. Um, 
uh, in California. Um, and so climate disorder was racialized again. And in the eyes of authorities, a more powerful police was the way to deal with it. And more specifically, using tactics from the colonies was the best way to deal with it. After all, those colonies were also filled with peoples racialized as inferior, as morally suspect, as having inherent tendencies towards vice and disorder. And so for these white officials, it was perfectly appropriate and logical to import colonial methods for the purposes of domestic policing. Um, again, racialized sort of analogization um, brings the boomerang home. And in fact, it was by this very logic that August Vollmer became police chief at Berkeley in the first place. Previously, Berkeley uh, was a small, sleepy college town, but it was close to Oakland and close to San Francisco. Um, and in that whole region, there had been rising fears of the increase of Chinese, Chinese migrants from elsewhere in California. Um, and white authorities had been especially appalled at Chinese gangsters and their opium dens um, that had purportedly been corrupting white morality and worse yet corrupting young white women. And so uh, Berkeley officials urged Volmer to become police chief exactly because of his experience in the Philippines where he had already dealt with the so-called oriental race. In fact, according to a newspaper account at the time, Volmer's friends said to him about the new police chief job, it will be a fighting job for whoever takes it. That's why we want you, Gus. You were a pretty good fighting man when you went up against those goo-goos over in the islands. Goo-goos was the term at the time for um, Filipinos and Asians. It was a derogatory term. So again, this racialized logic bringing back the boomerang. So let me try to head towards a conclusion with some, just some additional points. Now, so far, I've only talk and, talked about a couple of moments or a couple of waves of the imperial boomerang in the U.S. and Britain. But again, the larger story is that these, this is a repeated process happening over and over again. Um, in the U.S., for instance, the next major wave after Vollmer's in the early 20th century happened beginning in the late 1950s when police departments emulated colonial mobile forces and created what became called tactical units. One of the more prominent examples of these tactical units, but certainly not the only one, is of course SWAT, which I mentioned. Um, these are heavily militarized units and they emerged initially in the Los Angeles Police Department during the late 1960s, but in fact before SWAT, LA already had mobile tactical units that Volmer himself had created. In Chicago and New York in the late 1950s, new tactical units modeled after colonial military tactical units were also created, again predating SWAT teams. In New York, um, there was a force called the Tactical Patrol Force, um, and this was created, as I discussed in my book in 1959, in response to a perceived racialized crime wave of so-called gangs youth gangs consisting of Puerto Ricans and black youth. It was only later that the Los Angeles SWAT unit was created, and that too was the result of imperial importation and racialized threats. One of the creators was a veteran of, uh, of, of the military named John Nelson, and he and uh, uh, Daryl Gates, chief of police, later become chief of police, founded the new SWAT unit, modeled after army units, and it was in response to the ghetto riots of Watts, Detroit, and Newark. And Gates had referred to these riots explicitly as guerrilla warfare thereby making a powerful analogy between the riots and the, on the one hand and on the other anti-colonial rebellions in Vietnam and British Africa and elsewhere. Now, tactical units also boomerang back to Britain. And this makes perfect sense as, in fact, tactical police units and military units had been prominent in the British Empire and had been an important resource for colonial regimes. For example, um, in my book I talk a lot, a, a lot about this, um, where, where I trace how tactical police units first emerged in parts of British India after the First World War, then how they spread to Singapore, um, and also how Northern Ireland served as a site for experimentation with such units. Um, they then boomerang back to cities like London with the creation of the Special Patrol Group, which was a response to the newly perceived racialized threat of post-Windrush immigration. And of course, since that time, the boomerang effect has continued in yet more ways. In many US cities in recent years, for instance, veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars have advised law enforcement or even served as police officers themselves. What they've been trying to do is use counterinsurgency techniques from Iraq and deploy them in order to police gangs in minority neighborhoods. 
They've been working with police to develop new technologies and tactics um, and procedures taken from the military, including new computer algorithms, surveillance software, um, and social network theory, resulting in the construction of the so-called gang databases, or the gang matrix, much of which has been provided by companies like Palantir, which makes the software platforms for these counterinsurgency policing projects. And here again, we find the same logic of racialization and importation at work, as veterans turn to uh, turn police officers justify the use of these techniques on the ground that gangs are like insurgents and insurgents are like gangs. And I'm sure that many of you know here in Britain similar processes have unfolded. Um, this is where we get the literature on the paramilitary turn in British policing in the 1980s by which, by which the British police in, began employing the tactics and technologies of the Royal Hong Kong Police and Northern Ireland units. I'm sorry, this is in the U.S. Um, case where U.S. officers are going to Israel to train and learn colonial techniques there. Um, uh, and so what you have is uh, in Britain um, the development of things like also the tricks. Um, Adam Elliott Cooper here has talked about this. Patrick Williams over at Man Manchester Metropolitan has also looked at gang da databases and the policing of gangs. Again, I would argue that this has to be seen as part of this larger boomerang effect. Right? You can also look at the fact that police have intensified surveillance efforts of Muslim populations using a, uh, automated number plate recognition and CCTV cameras whose maintenance has been subcontracted out to a company called Olive Group, the same group that had conducted surveillance operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. We could also look at things like the police killing in 2005 in London of Jean Charles de Menes, uh, a, a shooting that happened under the, the guidelines that the police had adopted for shoot to kill tactics. These shoot to kill tactics um, had been taken from British army forces in Northern Ireland, Israeli forces operating in the occupied territories, and Israeli forces themselves. So we could talk about all of these ways in which the boomerang, triggered by perceived racialized threats, have impacted policing to this day. But what I hope to show is that none of this is new. This goes back to the very founding of modern policing. So let me conclude with, uh, by returning to this puzzle right, that I began with this talk. Um, why is the civil police militarized? Um, I've noted that in the discourse, the civil police is theoretically about protecting citizens. Policing should therefore be peaceful, indeed civil. Um, the military colonial police, meanwhile, are aimed at repressing ostensibly inferior subjects and enemies and thereby employ uncivil tools, violent militaristic methods. The militarization of policing through imperial feedback means that those boundaries are transgressed. Right? Citizens are treated like colonial subjects. But why? How is it that the so-called civil police have come to treat citizens as if they are enemies and colonial subjects, using the same means and methods that they use on the latter? Well, now that we understand the coloniality of policing, the answer is plain. The civil police adopt militaristic colonial modes of coercion on citizens and treat those citizens like colonial subjects because police see citizens as colonial subjects. And the primary modality for this categorical transformation, the key social code by which this miraculous transubstantiation of citizens into subjects occurs, is racialization. By racialization, citizens are constructed to be inferior, dangerous, inherently violent, just like colonized peoples. They are seen as subhuman specters, the dark criminal, the dark colonial subject, who encapsulate the white public's feverish fantasies of fear and horror. Racialization thus transfigures citizens into, as Akil Mbembe puts it in a different context, um, a menacing object, uh, sorry, a menacing object from which one must be protected or escape or which must simply be destroyed if it cannot be subdued. And this racialization in turn warrants, indeed demands, the importation of militarized tools, tactics, and technologies that ho had been originally developed and deployed for colonized peoples abroad in the first place. And so there's a bigger story here. Um, that may already be noticed by some of you. So I'm here hoping 
that this story of militarized policing mounts a larger claim about our modern present. And the claim is the whole premise of the post-colonial decolonial group. Um, and it might be banal to some degree, but it's nonetheless worth reiterating. And that is our modern present is not separate from the history of colonialism. The logics and operations of power to which we are subjected are not distant from those that empire wrought. Empire has been constitutive of modernity, both in its peripheral and metropolitan forms. And if we are to apprehend our present, we must reckon with the constitutive, constitutive character of police of imperialism upon it. Reckoning in this case, in particular, with the fact that modern forms of social control and violence in the metropole are born from colonial conquest and its racialized logics. Colonialism and empire, their modes of power, their mechanisms of control, the regimes of justification and legitimation have been foundational for our metropolitan modernity, constitutive of the police power, whether that power be in Belfast, Manila, the Philippines, Mumbai, New York, London, or Manchester. And this is why, to finally conclude, I'd venture to say that the civil police is not just like colonialism, but rather could justifiably be seen as a form, colonial, uh, form of colonialism itself. Right? Policing, born out of colonial suppression, birthed from empire, has been at its core an intrinsically militaristic, imperial, and racial project. And any attempt to reform policing today would need to recognize this core feature of this otherwise seemingly neutral and seemingly reformable institution we ironically call it. Thank you. really rich, provocative talk. Uh, we have about 20 minutes for questions. Um, so who would like to start? Hannah. Thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. I really enjoyed it. Um, I have two quick questions, if that's OK. Um, I wanted to ask you about ideas of white innocence and personally how um, these systems are often in broader discourse, separate from colonial histories, and how that kind of collective amnesia of, for example, the UK and US's involvement in colonialism, how, how, how does that keep sustaining these systems? Um, and secondly, I just wanted to ask whether you consider how these techniques work outside of the official police, so in systems of housing systems and welfare systems as well. How colonial form, the latter part is how colonial form. Sorry, how the um, colonial logics um, uh -huh. work outside of the formal institution of the policing. Uh -huh. and so there's kind of spatial containment aspects you're talking about yeah. working in housing. Uh, that's a really good question. Thank you for those. So the, la the second one, for, uh, second one first, and the answer. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's exactly the kind of thing that needs to be done. I think that when you need to research this, you may already have some work in mind, and we'd love to hear it. But it's exactly the the various ways in which colonial forms um, have a, a palpable presence in all of these seemingly uncolonial institutions that I think we should recover. Yeah. There is, again, I think, a colonial unconscious to our society. And as a sociologist, it's imperative for me to uncover that colonial unconscious. And again, it impacts policing, I'm arguing. It probably impacts a lot of other institutions, maybe in different ways. Maybe the institutions vary, but it's something that we need to, to analyze. And I'm not, you know, I'm very much and, uh, at my at, at my core, a, a hopeless empiricist. So I don't want to say that it permeates well for institutions, for example, without actually seeing the research. Um, the first question. Can you repeat that one? No. Yeah, I was just really interested in how denying the kind of colonial pasts and keeping this idea of um, whiteness as um, kind of innocence yeah. and kind of separating from yeah. the violences that have been committed. And yeah. the how, how do these kind of work in one big policing? Yeah, so um, this amnesia, I think that that's part of the way I think about the short answer is, I don't, again, I don't know how it works here, I'd love to hear more, but in the United States, there's an, a consistent denial yeah. of the racialized violence and the racialized imperial history. So if, if it's not complete ignorance, and it often is, and you can ask a police officer in the United States, do they know what's going on? They'll say yes. You can ask them, do they, do they know that in mapping these techniques that you're using, they're using the they'll, they'll say they have no idea and they reject that to no end. So I think there's also denial, right? So when discourses emerge that slave patrols were the first police, there's constant denial 
And I understand that now. These are police officers who have devoted their careers to what they think is a benign institution often. And so I, I don't want to, you know, you know, I, I want to recognize the reality. Um, and so I think that there's an intellectual and cognitive denial, but I think that the other important thing is that that intellectual and cognitive denial comes with the institutional denial that the police in the United States are very powerful, that they're unionized, they control politicians, and they can fight off any attempt to fundamentally criticize what they're doing. And that's why, at least in the United States, the abolitionist movement is so insistent that police reform is problematic. By reforming the police, you're just perpetuating the system. And nobody's happier to reform the police than the police themselves, <laughs> because it gives them an excuse to continue. And part of that is rejecting that there's anything intrinsically colonial or racist about policing. I would argue that all of the evidence, all the research that I'm trying to convey is that this is an intrinsically colonial and racialized institution. And so reform has to be thought of in that, in that respect. It has to be thought of as little else than tinkering. Um, and so I think the ideology of the civil police, the rejection of the colonial and racial logics are part of the way in which um, the policing system works. It's, it's essential for the policing system. Um, Sharon, please. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think I can guess your answer, and I think you hinted at the end. But my question was, like, are you coming at this as an abolitionist? Let me unsettle the idea of the police, obviously. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, are you an abolitionist, or do you think? That, <laughs> do you think there's a version of this thing? Uh, like, I think you said it's like the civil police is a mask, um, mm -hmm. and it's like a tool of propaganda. It's the idea, mm -hmm. it's not the reality. Like, yeah. Do you think the, rea the idea would be realized? So, good, great question. Um, let me just answer by sort of saying that um, when I first started this research, it was in the wake of Ferguson in 2014. Um, I had long been studying the American Empire, and I really noticed, of course, the militarization. And this is, to me, a colonial and militarist, so I began researching it. I was not um, versed in the political, the police literature. So I started out as a kind of reformist, as I've done the research. I've seen more events unfold as I've listened to the voices of folks in the <coughs> South Side of Chicago where I live. I've come to be my Christians. Um, and you know, I'm not proud to say that because I'm, I, it's not an ideological thing. It is informed by what I come to learn and research. So yes, <laughs> I'm an abolitionist. Uh, of course, depending on what that means. Um, part of the problem with the abolitionist discourse is that we also have to think we have to use our imagination because you can't just abolish the police. If you abolish the police, what will remain is the police power. And we have to keep that distinction. There's the police power of the state, and there's the particular form that is taken in the modern police departments. So you can get rid of modern police departments, but you might not have ch changed the police power. And so we have to think broadly about that. I don't have an answer to that, but I think it's the sort of discussions that we need to have that we can't just do. Of course, getting rid of the police is the first step. And thinking about how we can, if we are to maintain a police power at all, you know, be careful about how um, abolishing the police might just lead to new forms of oppression that we are um, recognizing, whether it's a the institutions or in other institutions. Um, so yes, I'm an abolitionist, but I'm a, uh, a pessimistic abolitionist <laughs> with some cautious optimism. <laughs> thank, you. Uh, on um, thank you so much for a fascinating talk. Um, uh, I was just wondering, um, you know, you, your, your talk is premised on the basis that there's this civil discourse to what you think is that goes back to Peel, and then there's your racial, uh, your um, very persuasive argument about it's um, racial, colonial, colonial undertones and overtones. Um, one of the other things that is uh, that Peel is often remembered for is saying that the police of the public and the public of the police. Mm. And so I was just wondering, what is the you've presented to us? Uh, you know, yeah, a very convincing top-down interpretation of what the police is and the military logic in the police. But I was, you know, at the end of the day. Ordinary people become police officers and they 
are implicated in policing. And so I just wondered if you thought about the dynamic between who polices and what policing is, and then, yeah, whether there's, um, yeah, yeah, I just think it's an interesting dynamic yeah. that ordinary people are involved in policing too, that the, the police yeah. are us. Yeah. Great question. Um, so I have two immediate responses. One is, um, this is where I think it's actually helpful to think about policing as colonialism. Because everything we can say about colonialism, a policing you can say about colonialism. Colonialism is this institution, but it's created by people. It's a reflection of society at the time. It, it embeds deep assumptions. Um, and colonialism was a top-down thing, but it was an expression of perceived metropolitan demands and wants. And so, for me, as someone who's studying colonialism before studying policing, it's really helpful for me to think about that because when I study colonialism, the individuals involved is not as important as the structure. And so when I think of police, I think about it as a, from the structural perspective. And so, you know, that's why when in the United States a month ago you have black, five black police officers beating up mercilessly a, a black uh, resident, um, that's expressive of this deep structure. Right? It's not, it's, to me, it's, that's not an, uh, an example of how policing isn't racist. It's an example of how deeply racist policing is because it's an institution where everyday people get embedded in this institution and they get molded and interpolated into thinking in certain ways. And that is connected to society because the way they think is reflective of the way in which a certain sector of society thinks, a certain sector of people who think about crime as essentially a racial problem, who uh, think of crime as uh, pervasive and endemic. Um, you know, I, I liken the white citizens of Chicago, where I live, to colonial settlers who see danger everywhere, right? In every passing black or brown face, they see danger. It's the same colonial mentality right, that leads to the forms of violence that you have in colonies. And that's, again, why I think policing, it's helpful for me to think about policing as a colonial institution in exactly that sense. So I hopefully that gets, the short answer is policing is a structure. Right. It's not just a question. Uh, thanks very much for that wonderful talk. I particularly enjoy the historical context, and yeah, absolutely wonderful. Um, I, mean, I was just wondering whether you had the thought about thinking about this in you know, sort of like broader context beyond uh, the US and the UK context. Uh, again, you know, thinking about that boomerang effect. Yeah. Did you ever notice a similar or the presence of the same effect I mean, or within the other? For the European empire, yeah. so thinking about the Spanish and the Portuguese and yeah. the Dutch and the, yeah. what have we got to think about the Germans in relation to the way they produce the colonies? Yeah. And, and I think it might be useful thinking this way broadly rather than reducing these effects to just the US or UK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for your point. I mean, that's a very important point. Um, Again, as an empiricist, I, I hesitate to say anything until I look at those sites. Um, I initially wanted to research U.S., Britain, and France, but it became too big. But France is clear. I mean, the, the French police have long been militarized, but they really take on um, you know, militarized payments um, when Algerians come to you know, in the 20th century. We can't forget the way in which Algerians were massacred in the 50s. And, you know, this was... Um, resulting from partly the, the way in which the police in Paris and France had become colonial forces. So I do think that the same story applies in France. Um, it's unclear the way it happens in other European contexts. I will say that what you have is a broad circulation of these te tactics and technologies. So initially, I'm arguing that initially it begins as a racialized set of tools and tactics, but then they become modular and they can be picked up and used anywhere in different contexts, and that's what's so dangerous about them, right? So I suspect that what's happened is, um, you know, these tactics are brought in from the colonies, they get institutionalized in the metropole in the U.S. and Britain, then they circulate around because other countries want to emulate them, and, and they're really picking up these tactics and techniques, not directly from the colonies, but from their embedded form, which have become modular. And certainly, um, 
they go back to the colonies again in new forms, right? So the Philippines have a militarized situation. They're adopting the war on drugs to justify killings. Um, and it's a whole circulation. And, you know, the boomerang effect I think of as the beginning point in a larger global transnational circulation of tools of violence which originate in colonial sites and then get lifted up and brought around to be used by state power everywhere. And that's a complex process. I think we need to trace that up more. Um, and uh, yeah, I would encourage folks to, to do that. Yeah. Hi, Jigun. Um, welcome to Manchester. I'm really glad to see you here. And uh, thanks for your very uh, provocative talk. I think uh, I'd just like to say that what you're suggesting, I think, I don't know if you agree with this, is actually um, quite provocative compared to what a lot of the dominant understanding is about colonial policing, because I think the dominant understanding of co uh, policing in the colonies is um, that, the, that policing in the colonies was a lot more brutal than it was um, in the metropole. And I don't know if you intend this to uh, be inferred from what you're saying, but I think some people, some people might uh, infer this, which is that the boomerang effect seems to suggest that it's almost like an equivalent of how policing was done um, in the colonies and in the metropole. But um, another uh, interpretation of this, um, which I'm kind of like, you know, caught between what you're saying and this other opinion, is that actually the the policing was um, much different in colonies. So, for example, like talk about other people, talk about like policing by consent. This concept, I think, as far as I know, is um, hard to find in the colonies. Where, they, where, for example, like you know, the waterboarding example you've given, it's a lot more, I think, regularly used and routine in the colonies than it ever would have been um, in the metropole. So, there's a danger, I think. I don't know what you think about this, but there's potentially a danger that. We're drawing an equivalent between how policing yeah. is carried out in the colonies and in the metropole, which I think if you look at contemporary, so it's the last thing I want to say, if you look at contemporary um, criminal justice systems, which not just policing, but also prisons and also laws, you can you can see I think there's still a big disparity between the way that policing, prisons and laws are enacted in let's say the UK compared to in Commonwealth countries where the laws, the policing and the prisons are still a lot harsher. Um, than they are in the UK, because in the UK, although we do have all these problems, like you said, about policing, I think there's still a lot more rights mm. and protections for the citizen, even the racialized citizen, than there would be in a lot of the Commonwealth. So the point is just that, is, it, is there really a boomerang effect, or is there actually quite a difference in the way that policing mm. was done in the metropolitan and the mm. Mm. Very good question. Um, <clears throat> I do think there's a difference. I think that what happens with the boomerang effect is that um, tactics and techniques and forms are brought in to the metropole, but then they have to be dressed up. Right? So Peel comes up with the idea of policing by consent, but that is a sort of domestication of colonial forms. Peel, um, you know, Peel didn't arm the London police. That's a clear difference with the Irish constabulary, for example. Um, but he gave them truncheons and told them to hide them from public view. So. There is a difference, and I think what happens is that the, the police and the metropole adopt these colonial forms and tactics, but then they have to dress them up with terms like the civil police, and they have to have some sense of policing by consent. And I would argue that um, that was deliberate by Peel, really, I think really was concerned about the Irish. I think all these cases, these officers are concerned about a particular group. But they know that they're deploying the police on the streets where there's also um, other residents who uh, they have to sell the police to. Right? And so I do think there's a process of ideological work going on here that masks what I think are crucial similarities that we tend to overlook. So short answer, there are differences. I think the differences are probably less than we um, would want to admit. Um, and I think that there's a strategic and rhetorical and intellectual value in thinking harder about the similarities. Because one of the things I see, at least in the US, and I fear maybe will happen here, is that while there are differences, those differences are becoming less and less. Especially as fascist political rulers take over. Um, the tools are already there for them to use the second they decide to. And so the infrastructure for colonialism at home, real colonialism at home, not just metaphor, is being set up already through this process. And so I, I, I want us to be alert to that. And I think the United States, yes, it's, it's becoming more and more like it would be in America's uh, overseas. It's, it's becoming a lot more. South South Chicago's becoming a lot more. 
um, like uh, Iraq. And this is something the Black Panthers themselves realized, right? Like the police action. It, 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 this is something that these communities already see. Right? Um, it's something that police officers in the United States see also. Some police officers come back from this Israeli training and they realize we can't use those tactics here, but we may need to. So, I think the lines are there, the differences are there, but I really am trying to get us to think about the similarities more than the differences. Um, thank you so much. Your talk. Um, I'm interested in kind of the imagery that you used, and it made me wonder where like gender and class come into yeah. your analysis. <laughs> yeah. Yep. For sure. Great question. Um, important question. So the class thing I'll take um, first. Um, so there is a traditional line of thinking. Um, not traditional, but it's it's the common line of thinking that critiques police such as in these works, um, as a tool of capital accumulation, and it's essentially a plastic project. Um, my concern with these works is that race is not a problem. It's always the white working class is the image. And I would argue that policing is really a racial, a race and class formation. But it's not just any working class. It's the racialized subproletariat. That is the distinct group beneath white workers that have been put into forms of labor um, forced into forms of labor that are crucial for capitalism, but which is denigrated, not represented in the kinds of white industrial work. Right? So I think it's class articulates with race to create uh, policing in a lot of police's rationale. It's about dealing with this particular class, not just the working class in general. Gender, of course, is everywhere, and uh, you know, I it's endemic to colonial occupation.